deciphering the cellular immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and the link to malaria exposure in Ghanaian COVID-19 patients. You have uh, 15 minutes total, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for questions. And when there's two minutes left or one minute left, I'll let you know. All right, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kesero Tapela. So my talk today will be on the um, deciphering the cellular immune response of SARS-CoV-2 and link it to previous malaria infections in Ghanaian patients. So for the... Okay. Okay, so for the past two years, we have been faced by a challenge of COVID-19, of which it has infected almost 680 million people, and of, from them, about, we lost about 6.8 million um, people. So in Ghana here, where my study is based, uh, we had around 171,000 cases, and we lost like 1.5 thousand um, uh, patients. So COVID-19 was um, characterized by different waves, of which we have four uh, main waves. Uh, we have the fifth and the sixth, and currently we have um, very, very low cases. But however, the research continues. Uh, COVID-19 is um, caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it has four in important structural proteins, the spike nucleocapsid membrane, of which helps it uh, for its pathogenesis. Upon infection with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, the body uh, tends to elicit immune response, the innate uh, immune response, and the adaptive um, immune response of which they generate T cells and B cells to help fight uh, the virus. Uh, just a, a brief um, about the immune response. So upon infection with the virus, um, um, the antigen pre uh, presenting cells uh, tend to be stimulated where they ingest the virus and then the uh, production of the B cells, the T cells, and finally the, the antibodies which help, um, um, which help to, to, to kill the virus. So um, questions have been asked, why do we have um, low cases or mild cases of SARS-CoV-2 in uh, Africa, especially Ghana? Uh, that's where my study is about. We are trying to find or to characterize the immune response of COVID-19 patients, um, comparing symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. And also research has um, linked this mildness to um, previous infections with malaria. Uh, papers have been wrote. And with that, um, it tend to link the cellular immune response to uh, mal previous malaria exposure. So with that, the aim of this uh, study was to identify cellular composition uh, associated with asymptomatic or symptomatic and linked to uh, malaria. This is just um, a summary of um, the, sample, the sample processing. We collected blood samples from COVID-19 patients and we did antibody uh, quantification using an in-house ELISA. Then we did some surface staining, targeting uh, phenotypic characteristics of the cellular immune response. We did for T cells, we did for B cells, and we did for monocytes. We also did some intracellular staining where we stimulated our PBMCs with spike, with nucleocapsin, and also with uh, the DD2, which is um, a strain for, for P falsporum. And we um, we then uh, did the markers for the cytokines that targeted the groups of the T's helper T cells. And also we did this through flow cytometry. So first we wanted to compare the ratio of the CD4 and CD8. Ratio of CD4 and CD8. You know the ratio of CD4 and CD8 has to range between one and three. If it's below one, it shows uh, immune, immune compromisation. And if it's um, more than between one and three, then we said the person is probably uh, healthy. So if we compare our 
symptomatic and asymptomatic. We didn't find any um, significant difference between the two. And whereas other studies have found a lower um, CD4, CD8 ratio, which was linked to immune compromisation in other places. We went ahead to compare the cell proportions between um, CD4 and CD8. And um, we didn't find any significant difference between the CD4 and uh, the symptomatic and asymptomatic with the CD4 cells. However, we found um, higher cell proportions uh, in asymptomatic compared to symptomatic in CD8. And when we do the activation, it shows that the CD4 are actually activated, both the CD4 and the CD8 are actually activated and in symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic. So even though we had higher cell population, uh, proportion of um, B cells, I mean CD8 in the asymptomatic, but the activation shows that the symptomatic are actually using more of CD8 as a compared to um, asymptomatic. We also went to do the B cells. Um, for the B cells, we, had, we also had higher uh, cell proportions between a higher cell proportion in asymptomatic as compared to symptomatic, but the activation also proved to us that cells are actually being used or activated in symptomatic as compared to uh, asymptomatic. Uh, same applies to, we also did the dendritic cells. We also did the monocytes, the classical, we defined it into classical and non-classical monocytes. So the classical monocytes are the ones that are involved in the production of pro incremental cytokines and we found them to be higher in symptomatic as compared to symptomatic, uh, proving that uh, the symptomatic patients are actually uh, eliciting more of pro inflammatory cytokines as compared to um, asymptomatic. And also we did some T cell specific, the uh, intracellular staining, and we are comparing, uh, also comparing the symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic, the CD4 and uh, this for both CD4 and CD8. Um, as previously found, we found that indeed the, uh, the symptomatic patients are eliciting more of um, this, this high cell proportion in symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic for both CD4 and CD8, as also compared to nucleocapsid. So we also tried to compare nucleocapsid and, asymptom um, nucleocapsid and spike. We didn't find any significant difference between those. So for the malaria part, um, we also stimulated uh, with uh, malaria, um, the parasites, and uh, uh, the symptomatic patients also uh, had higher cell proportions as compared to asymptomatic, showing that uh, maybe the infection, um, the previous infection with malaria can actually be mirroring the, what SARS-CoV-2 is also doing, because the different, um, the, uh, the immune response tend to be uh, similar. We did some antibody production, for um, five, different, um, five different antigens of which were targeting the, uh, the parasites. These are the antigens that are mostly in the blood stage of malaria, so they're mostly important for the malaria infections. Uh, so we found that asymptomatic reactions actually had higher um, antibody production, anti-malaria production as compared to symptomatic, so which co shows that um, which may be um, concluded that as um, um, asymptomatic, uh, I mean, previous exposure to malaria can actually protect or asymptomatic patients. That's why we maybe have milder cases of, um, of COVID-19 in Ghanaian patients. So in summary, I would say uh, we have increased cell activation and exhaustion in symptomatic as compared to asymptomatic. There was higher percentage of self um, B cell frequencies, even though the activation was higher in symptomatic patients, and also the classical um, cell proportions were higher in symptomatic. And also, we can this more of like a foundation. We can say SARS-CoV-2 stimulate the immune response to um, parasites in COVID-19 patients, and also asymptomatic patients are being protected by the anti-malaria um, antibodies as compared to as um, symptomatic. And with that, I would like to thank my supervisors, Dr. Kwashi, um, the participants, and also uh, Dr. Diana, Franklin, and Danielle for helping with the malaria work, my funders, oh, thank you. Thank you, Kesejo. Okay, right off the bat. Um, we have two questions in the back there. Thank you for your really excellent talk. 
Uh, can I ask, how do you know that people who produce more antibodies against plasmodium don't also simply produce more antibodies or have a better immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and that's why they were asymptomatic. They're just, they have really good immune systems, both, for both. How can you, what would you do to figure that out? Can you please repeat the question again? So he's asking that, how do you know that people who have high antibody response uh, to plasmodium, mm -hmm. maybe they just produce good antibodies? So how do you know, how will you test that if that's the reason? Or, or maybe David repeated so that, I'm not sure if it, I got the full input. Okay, so, um, hmm. <laughs> Okay, I'll answer that later. Can I have the next question, please? <laughs> um, nice talk. Um, how, how possible is it in this system, if you're going forward, to do longitudinal studies? Because a one-off time point doesn't really indicate what the past history of malaria was, nor how many infections they'd had. And antibody responses to malaria are really dependent on the number of infections you've had and when in the season you have taken the samples. And so you need just to be a bit careful with a single cross-sectional study. That's my first point. Um, and the second one is, are you familiar with the literature, very old, on the association of systemic lupus erythematosus with malaria, um, which is the opposite way around, where malaria, um, people from Africa, from endemic areas, tend to make lower inflammatory responses. And this actually in makes you more susceptible to SLE. And so there are some genetic components coming in here. It might be that you have some people who make just good inflammatory responses and others who make worse inflammatory responses. And that might be, that might segregate along your asymptomatics and symptomatics. So do you know more about their history? I think is my key question. Okay, about malaria? Yeah, I think. No, um, I'm not an expert in malaria, so I, I don't know about malaria. The first question was longitudinal. Yeah, so um, what about the longitudinal? We You've done a cross-sectional. Yes. Time yes. And you find that you get higher malaria antibody titers. Mm -hmm. But you don't know what went before. You don't know how many malaria infections. You don't know when they had the last one. And that will all impact on the tighter of antibody. OK. So, so these uh, patients, they, they, went, they didn't have malaria at a point that we're doing. But they might have had it two weeks ago. So the question is, did you follow the patients? So we followed them for, um, for COVID-19, but not for malaria. So your question is on malaria, right? <laughs> Yeah. In a cohort where you can't detect malaria or whatever else you want to detect. Okay. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? There's a question in the. Yes. Okay. I think Maria might have the mic so you can ask.
Je pense que ça pourrait étayer ou corroborer ou euh, en tout cas donner une suite logique à vos résultats. Merci beaucoup. Okay, I'm going to summarize that. So, um, in agreement with the previous comment, maybe there's some genetic components that would either corroborate or go against uh, the findings. So, uh, it might be beyond the scope of your study, but uh, maybe it was a suggestion, right? Um, maybe some genetic work would would uh, be called for. Do you agree? Uh, there was a question. Mike, can we have a mic in the center there? Oh, okay. Which will be Merci. from uh, founding. I'm, I'm having some little concern. Here we are talking of uh, malaria and antibody giving across uh, protection to viral condition. And this is the first time we are, we are seeing this. We have other viral conditions that have been, Africans have been suffering from, uh, like HIV. We never had uh, there was any protection. The malaria. Uh, antibody has been in existence for some time now in our immune system. Uh, this founding is is is, irre is it really convincing that this is what is actually giving us protection against COVID-19 in Africa, or there are other factors that she has not look, really looked into. So he's asking that it's. Uh, surprising that malaria has been there for a long time other viruses have been there but there's no uh, there was no previous evidence of the antibody given protection mm -hmm. so what are your comments on that okay so maybe studies have not been done on that other viruses Maybe with um, SARS-CoV-2, we're just all curious because it was a worldwide thing and um, we were curious and we're just uh, exploring um, different um, aspects and uh, we found that um, malaria, which is the health symptom, I mean, almost the same symptoms as COVID-19, that we end up linking into it. So I'm thinking maybe for other viruses, we haven't explored enough. Maybe there's something somewhere there. Okay, so even though I'm the chair, because I presented a little earlier on, um, I think I'll, I'll do a little bit of redirect. Uh, so to answer David's question, there was no difference in antibody levels between spike and nucleocapsid between the two groups. Uh, there was no significant differences between the two groups in the cohort. And then to answer this, I don't think she's presenting cross-protection. Cross so it's not, it's not an issue of cross-protection in terms of direct binding. It's just a correlation. So, um, and then in the case of HIV, it's, it's a bit of a different case. So you can't really do those um, correlations. Any other questions? Yes. Merci. Euh, je voudrais peut-être abonder dans le même sens de la discussion. Euh, en pa parlant de paludisme et Covid-19, je pense que euh, sous ceux qui ont parlé avant moi, on dit qu'en Afrique, nous avons eu moins de cas. Et la problématique était de savoir pourquoi nous avons eu moins de cas en Afrique. Et nous savons que la COVID-19 fait intervenir beaucoup le système immunitaire. Et donc, la question était de savoir est-ce que les Africains étaient beaucoup plus immunisés 
ou des réactions anticorps croisées avec ce virus. Donc, c est, c est, je pense que c'est dans cela, dans, dans ce sillage que le travail a été fait parce que la problématique était toujours là de savoir pourquoi les Africains ont fait moins de cas de Covid. Nous savons aussi que en dehors du paludisme qui est endémique et qui fait entretenir une immunité chez nous en Afrique, avant que nous, Africains, ne, ne grandissions, ne subsistions, nous faisons face à plusieurs agressions euh, virales, bactériennes qui nous permettent d'acquérir un certain nombre d'immunité. Certain, certain Et donc, du coup, je me dis, est-ce qu'il ne serait pas bien, comme quelqu'un l'a dit aussi tantôt, de mettre tout ça dans la balance pour savoir effectivement est-ce que c'est le palou ou beaucoup d'autres facteurs combinés qui font que les Africains ont été beaucoup plus réfractaires au Covid-19. Je pense que c'est toujours un problème qui se pose et on aimerait comprendre pourquoi ce phénomène ça, ça s'est passé comme ça. Merci. Ok. Um, I think uh, in the future, let's uh, keep the questions short. Um, I lost track of the... So, The, along the same lines was that it was reported that there were fewer cases in Africa. And then the question was, why is it that there were fewer cases in Africa? Is it because of, uh, was it because of an immune system um, difference? Or was it because that the African population is hyper immunized against different, uh, um, different uh, uh, ailments over the years. And then I, I missed the tail end of the, the, the question. So maybe now that she has the mic, you can finish the tail end, and then that will be the last question. Or you can start. Can you hear? So the question was, um, one time there were less cases of COVID-19. There were less cases. so. Do you think it's because we are, the immune system is different, whether we are hyperimmunized, or is there other factors? Because we've had a lot of uh, different infectious diseases over the years. I'm paraphrasing extremely here. Yeah. Okay, so there were less cases. Um, the reason of less cases may be that um, We probably didn't have less cases it was because we're asymptomatic and we're not testing, especially here in Africa. So we didn't have less cases. We had cases, but most people were asymptomatic and not, they were not being tested. That was the question, right? That was the question. Um, about the immune system. <laughs> okay, I think um, you can catch up during the break and uh, discuss this a little bit further. We, we need to move on. Okay, thank you. So, I'm going to call the next speaker, Francine Belange, who is going to present on seroprevalence of Rift Valley fever and its domestic in domestic ruminants in Cameroon. And this is an online presentation. So Francine, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Good morning. Good morning. So you have 15 minutes total, 10-minute uh, presentation, five-minute question. I'll inform you when you have one minute left. You may start. I'm not ready I'm not now. Let me try to share my screen.
Please, can you see my screen? Not yet. So if we, okay, it's almost there. Yes, we can see your screen now. So you, uh, can you please go into presentation mode and start? Okay, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share some of the results I have for my PhD. My name is Francine Sado from uh, the Center for Research in Infectious Diseases, and I'm in the University of Boya here in Cameroon. So my talk today is entitled Cell Prevalence of River Valley Fever Virus in Domestic Remains in Cameroon, and it will be presented to you according to this outline. As background, River Valley Fever is a mosquito-borne biohemorrhagic zoonotic disease which primarily affects domestic ruminants and humans. In animals, it is responsible of large episodics with high mortality rates in young animals, such as cattle, sheep, camels, and goats. In sheep and cows, the mortality rate can be up to 100%, and there is a vaccine that has been approved for veterinary use in endemic areas only. In humans, the disease is mainly linked to occupations such as veterinarians, shepherds, farmers, slaughterhouse workers. And um, in, 50, in 50 to 95 percent of cases, it manifests as flu like illness. This disease is responsible for hemorrhagic fever with a case fatality rate of up to 2 percent. And this case fatality rate could be higher than 34 percent in naive population. And there is no vaccines that have been approved for human use already. Here you have pictures of animals that um, that was infected by this disease and they died. And here is the symptomatic uh, is the symptoms of this disease in humans. The epidemiology of this disease, the River Valley fever was firstly described in Kenya in the Great River Valley in 1930, and it is non endemic in it is known to be endemic in Africa. It has been so it has been responsible for epidemics in recent years, in 2019, in Sudan, and in 2020 and 2022 in Mauritania, and also in Senegal. The transmission of this disease is mainly mediated by various species of mosquitoes, including Aedes pulex and Ophelis. And during antiepizotic periods, there is a, when Aedes mosquitoes lay eggs, there is transviral transmission of the virus to the eggs. And when there is heavy handful during epi episodic or epidemic cycles, there is uh, those eggs that were transvirally infected by the virus hatch, and they just try they just spread the virus to domestic ruminants firstly, and those that are in close contact that have a safe of occupational disease that are in close contact with those animals such as veterinarian shepherd and slaughterhouse workers. They can be infected through direct contact with body fluids or tissue of uninfected animals. And the disease can spread then to the human population through mosquito bites by one people that is infected here through mosquito bite, and they can share the disease and cause epidemics. In Cameroon, there is really limited data concerning river fever virus. And we have only one study that has been conducted in human population with 12% of IgG cell problem that was found in the pygmy population. That was in a study carried out in 2015-2012. And there are sporadic cases of river fever in livestock in Cameroon with a cell prevalence of IgG varying from 2 to 23% on small ruminants. And IgM and IgG have been also uh, described in cattle and small ruminants. This is in 2013-2014. Thus, we wish to know what is the current si uh, situation concerning this uh, virus in the country. To answer this question, we have as objective determine the cell prevalence of river lake fever in domestic ruminants in two markets in the central region of Cameroon. Specifically, we we aim to ask, to describe the animal species according to their origins, determine river lake fever IgG and IgM cell prevalence, and compare G cell prevalence between cattle and small ruminants. To achieve these objectives, we conducted a cross-sectional and descriptive study in the two markets of the central region of Cameroon, 2019, 2020, and 2021, after obtaining the authorization from the Ministry of Fisheries and Animal Industry. We collected blood samples in cattle markets, a cattle market and single market, where we collected samples from sheep and goats. 
the sample was transported to the lab using pullers where they were processed in order to obtain the plasma, and the plasma was conserved into the minus 20 until further analysis. For the further, for the analysis, the plasma were used for the detection of IgM using a captured ELISA and IgG using a competitive ELISA by the kit described by uh, provided by IgVet. On the IgM negative, the IgM negative sample was then put back into the fridge, and the IgM positive sample were used for the detection of rivalry fever using a real-time PCR, and the positive real-time PCR samples were used for the amplification of the L segment of pancreaviruses using pangenous primers. As a result, over whole, 756 animals were collected, including 441 cattle, 168 goats, and 147 sheep. 73% of the collected cattle were from Cameroon, 22 from Chad, and 4 from Sudan. All sheep and goats were, were collected in Cameroon, like you have seen, you can see in this graph, in the north region of Cameroon. Most of the livestock collected were mainly maize because of uh, their cost effectiveness and because they are also, um, because of their cost effectiveness, and uh, females were preserved for reproduction and also milk production. So these similar results were seen by Hugh and colleagues in 2010. Concerning the IgG cell prevalence, we observed a high IgG cell prevalence in cattle compared to small ruminants, and this difference was statistically significant. 42% of the cattle were IgG positive, 2% of sheep, 2.72% of sheep, and 2.38% of goats. And this cell prevalence was higher than those observed in 2000. 2014, um, where they conducted the research in the different sites of the country. And it is comparable to other situations found in other African countries, such as Mozambique and South Africa. And this could explain the dynamics of activity of the virus in Cameroon, or maybe a possible silent circulation of the virus, or maybe a circulation of a rivalry fever, less pathogenic uh, rivalry fever virus lineage. Concerning other countries where cattle were originating, we found high cell prevalence from cattle coming from Sudan and Chad. And this highlight the, and here we hypothesize that it could be a possible introduction from countries with no nuclear fever outbreak history. And this highlights the necessity for a transborder zoonosis surveillance system using a one health approach. Concerning the IgM cell prevalence rates, we found low uh, IgM cell prevalence in all animals uh, of 0.9%, and it was 1.13% in cattle, 1.36% in sheep, and no IgM were detected in, in goats. The six positive, six on the seven positive IgM samples were mainly coming from the north region of Cameroon, as we have seen on this graph. And this lower cell prevalence has also been observed in other African countries, such as Central African Republic and Democratic Republic of Congo. But as we have found IgM, we saw that this indicates an active situation of the virus in this region, in the north region of, of Cameroon. Concerning the detection of rivalry fever in, in IgM positive samples, we performed real time PCR, RT PCR, and we found uh, three positive samples with high CT values, and no amplicon was obtained while attempting to amplify a fragment of the A segment of levoviruses. And the similar results were also obtained from neighboring, neighboring countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is the main challenge while working with animals because we cannot predict the viremic phase compared to human, where you have some symptoms like flu like illness, and you can maybe attest that it could be the dynamic phase. So it is really the challenge with uh, animals. So at conclusion and perspectives, these results show the recent circulation of rivalry fever virus in livestock from Cameroon, and we found high IgG and IgM uh, prevalence in the North region and in other African countries, showing the necessity of the establishment of a zoonotic um, One Health approach system for control to control this disease. As perspective, we try we aim to investigate rivalry fever epidemiology in the North region to use genomics to characterize the rivalry fever strain using one health approach targeting the vectors, animals, and at risk human population. And this work permits us to publish a paper in plus negative tropical diseases. 
So I cannot finish my talk without thank you the institution that participated in this study, the funders and the team, principally my mentor, Dr. Regesimo, who financed this project through her PIVEX grant. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Francine. I'll kick off the uh, Q&A by asking about the IGM um, that you saw. You said in the north of Cameroon. Do you know what percentage of the Cameroon samples that was? The, the, what percentage of the samples from the north that you had IGM? Uh, thank you for your question. All the IgM positive samples were from originated from Cameroon. So all the IgM positive were from Cameroon. No IgM samples were coming from Sudan or from Chad. All were in Cameroon. That's why, uh, as perspective, we aim to investigate in this region because there is an active circulation of the virus there. We aim to investigate in that region to find that if we can find the virus, we will do it. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you for a very good uh, presentation. My question borders on age and breed and variation in this study. I don't know how you capture those two factors in arriving at uh, your results. Okay, thank you for your question. Concerning the age, it was really um, the main challenge of our study, or I can say, the, I don't know, let me put the video. It was the main challenge of our study because we know all that juvenile animals help us to predict maybe um, if there is recent circulation more, maybe if it, there is a recent circulation of the virus. But unfortunately, as we were working in markets only, uh, due to funding, the funding that was available, we were working only in markets, so we were unable to find juvenile animals to use for this study. So we work only on older animals. Okay. Any other questions? I have one. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, bonjour. Merci beaucoup. Je vais parler en en français. Euh, J'avais deux questions. La première, c'est de, de, de demander est-ce que vos données sont publiées et est-ce qu'il est possible euh, d'y accéder euh, dans le cadre d'une collaboration. Euh, la deuxième question, c'est euh, quels sont les outils que vous utilisez pour mesurer, euh, par exemple, les contagions euh, trans transfrontalières c'est-à-dire des euh, animaux qui passent euh, euh, d'un pays à l'autre. Comment vous faites pour euh, étudier et quantifier ces, euh, ces, trans, ces types de transmission Je vous remercie. Ok, merci pour... Let me speak in English. Ok, thank you for your questions. The first one was uh, to know if... Um, if our data are available are in an open access journal. So I can say yes, because I, I shown a picture of plus neglected tropical diseases. So the title is the same. You can type on PubMed, we have the paper, it's already available online. And for future collaboration, we are open to collaboration. So <laughs> you can, maybe you can have my contact through uh, Wanida's team and we could collaborate in that. And you were talking about the different um, ways of measuring the transbordering, so, uh, the transbordering transmission of the virus. Concerning this study particularly, what we were doing, we were using a questionnaire, a questionnaire base. So we were asking the origins of the different animals where we were collecting, on which we were collecting blood, and where, when they were telling us, we were up, up asking about the date, the exact date when animals enter uh, into Cameroon. So that's how we knew about the introduction or where the animals were originating. 
So the second way of doing this is by going on the sites, like the border sites of Cameroon, where there is usual uh, transborder movement of the animals from one country or from one region to another, and try to track the virus there. So that is another way of tracking these virus or other zoonotic viruses to be sure that it is due to the transborder animal movement. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Francine. So we'll move on to our next uh, speaker, which is also online. I seem to be. I seem to always have online speakers. Uh, this is uh, Priya Godara, who is a PhD student from Central University of Rajasthan, India. And she will present on a rational approach to designing peptide ligand conjugate based immunotherapy against the complicated malaria. Is uh, uh, Priya online? Am I audible? Am I audible, sir? We can hear you. Okay. May you share your slides? Uh, Please share your slides. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, very good morning to all the renowned scientists and researchers present in this Vanida Symposium. Myself, Priya Gudara, I'm a PhD scholar from Department of Biochemistry, Central University of Rajasthan, India. And the topic of my presentation is the rational approach for designing the peptide ligand conjugate based new therapy against the complicated malaria. Now, uh, responsible for nearly 247 million cases and 6,90,000 deaths in 2021, according to the latest report, malaria is one of the severe, most severe life-threatening infectious disease. Now, let's see the rising trend of malaria during the last five years. So, the first graph shows the reported malaria cases and second one shows the death cases of malaria. So, we see that the cases have continuously increased during the last decade. And the main reason for this is the continuous resistance in the parasites against most of the frontline antimalarial drugs. Now, among the different forms of malaria, complicated malaria, is, uh, which is caused by the plasmodium falciparum, is uh, responsible for the maximum number of deaths occurring. Now, let's quickly uh, see the real mechanism behind it. I'm using the pointer to explain this. So, uh, this is the infected uh, RBC. A parasite infected RBC, it, 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 it expresses a protein EMP1, erythrocyte membrane protein 1, which will, which will bind, which binds to the ICAM receptor present on the uh, surface of endothelial lining. And with this interaction, uh, it, this interaction leads to cytoadherence, in which the infected erythrocytes bind with the endothelial lining. It leads to uh, rosetting, where uh, the infected erythrocytes bind with the normal RBCs and uh, clamp. Hello, Priya, are you there? So, including the brain and the tissue gets hampered. Finally, this leads to the multi-organ failure in our body. Now, rationale behind the designing of peptide ligand conjugate based immunotherapy for complicated malaria. So, while doing the literature survey, we came across these two publications. In the first paper, uh, two compounds have been uh, developed, uh, two compounds have been tested, which block or reverse the binding of uh, EMP1 with the ICAM receptor. In the second paper, uh, heptin drug conjugate was uh, designed and it was tested in the mouse models. Uh, in this, in this uh, it, uh, it exploited a hybrid of two therapeutic approach. In the first approach, the drug uh, binds to the neuraminidase receptor, which was expressed on the virus in the cell. And in the second approach, the immunogenic heptin, uh, it uh, developed the uh, robust immune response reaction in the body, which uh, destroyed the virus infected cell. So after uh, looking at these two papers, we thought whether it is possible to design any therapeutic compound which may prevent sequestration in the endothelial blood vasculature, as well as uh, do the immune elimination of the infected erythrocyte. So these two major findings shape the current approach for targeting the PLC to the surface of infected erythrocyte. Now, uh, the basic architecture for design PLC include a ligand, which will prevent the sequestration in the endothelial blood vasculature by targeting the 
EMP1 receptor, which was which is uh, specifically expressed on the surface of the infected uh, RBC, a peptide, a cell targeting highly immunogenic peptide, which will trigger the body's immune reaction through the pre-existing vaccine-induced immunity, which will destroy the entire uh, uh, PLC decorated uh, infected erythrocyte and uh, non-cleavable linker, which will uh, finally join the ligand and the peptide. Now, selection of the potent ligands against EMP1 receptor. So, a total of 3,963 natural compound library was screened against the DBL2 beta domain of EMP1. And uh, the, the conserved active site, uh, active site residues include these. And uh, which these residues are present in the EMP1 receptor, which are responsible for binding to the ICAM receptor. So, these uh, active sites were provided as an input uh, during the grid generation step. And here we can see this is the crystal structure of the DBL2 beta domain of A type EMP1. Now, these are the docking scores of the top 10 compounds predicted in our study and uh, which were compared with the controls. And this is the uh, docking score of the controls used in our study. Now, the principal drug like properties uh, were predicted for the top three compounds. These are the top three compounds. And these are the values. And we see that these values lie in the acceptable ranges of the different parameters which are mentioned above. And next, the molecular interaction study was done for the top three, com uh, to top three complexes, and these are the interaction diagrams. Then we did the molecular dynamic simulation study of uh, top three compounds in complex with the EMP1, uh, EMP1 protein uh, on the basis of four parameters, RMSD, RMSF, RG, and SASA. And we found that all the three uh, compounds, all three complexes were stable in the uh, dynamic environment. Now, selection of the highly immunogenic peptides. So, these peptides were taken from the uh, commonly used vaccines in the malaria endemic countries. These are the list of vaccines. And from uh, and then we uh, found the highly immunogenic, and we took the highly immunogenic protein from these vaccines from the already published literature. And these are the list of highly immunogenic proteins. Now, the steps followed for getting the highly immunogenic peptides. In the first step, we uh, selected the protein-based vaccines commonly used in the malaria endemic countries. From them, we selected the highly immunogenic protein, as I mentioned uh, previously. Then from them, the identification of the highly immunogenic peptide stretches was done using the SVM trip server. And uh, then we analyzed the physicochemical properties using plot param server. And analysis of antigenicity, allergenicity, and toxicity was done using vaccine PRED, Alertop, and toxin PRED servers. And uh, one second. And uh, finally, uh, our study predicted these uh, these three uh, highly endogenic peptides uh, from pertussis vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, and meningococcal vaccine, uh, which are highly antigenic, low allergenic, low toxic, and physicochemically stable. Interestingly, we found that the yellow fever uh, vaccine is is documented to have lifelong antibody titer in our body, which is just adequate uh, to cause ADCC, which is uh, Antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity and uh, and cleared the entire PLC decorated uh, plasmodium falciparum infected RBC from the circulation. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, selection of the non cleavable linkers. So, on the basis of literature survey, we found three non cleavable linkers auxin, succinin, vidyl, thiether, and trizol. From these three, trizole linker mainly binds at the free OH functional group of the ligand. And this functional group, it, it is present in our uh, top three compounds. And for also, it forms an amide bond with the peptide molecule. So on the basis of this rationale, we have selected trizole linker uh, in our study. Now finally, uh, nine peptide-like ligand conjugates were designed in our study using the various combinations of the peptides in the ligands. Now, this is the entire, uh, this diagram presents the entire uh, summary of our work. Uh, you can see here, this is the infected RBC. It expresses uh, ANP1 receptor through which it binds with the ICAM receptor expressed on the endothelial lining, finally leading to uh, cytoadherence, clumping, and rosetting. And this is our design PLC. And uh, uh, the ligand in the PLC will bind to this, will bind to this uh, EMP1 receptor. And the highly immunogenic uh, peptide in our PLC, it will generate a, a very robust immune response in the body to clear this entire uh, 
compound uh, which is attached with this infected erythrocyte. Now these are the various steps which we followed for uh, peptide selection, ligand selection and selection of the non-cleavable linkers. And this work has been published in Life Sciences Journal and this study is first, first of its kind to be designed against complicated malaria. And uh, I now the acknowledgements. So a special thanks to my PhD supervisor, Dr. Dhaneshwar Krishti sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity for his continuous support and guidance. Vishwajit Naik, he is my senior. Rajshri Meghwal, she is a MSc junior. Dr. Rupal Oja, she is a senior and currently she is doing postdoc. Dr. Vijay Kumar Prajapati, he is associate professor and Varshita Srivastava, she is uh, my junior. And last but not the least, thank you Vanida for uh, this wonderful, for providing me this wonderful opportunity to present my research work uh, uh, through this platform and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Thank you Priya. We're uh, behind schedule so we'll take one question online, or one question here. Uh, let's try and make it brief. Uh, this, this is a wonderful presentation. I want to be very quick with regard to your, you know, research. Do you have any plan, you know, that you intend really to put forward? You have actually helped us with an in silico kind of, you've given us an in silico finding, which is really suggesting a potential for that conjugate to really help stop cytoadherence. And I feel you must have something in mind that you probably plan to do, maybe your research group plan to do, that would probably corroborate, you know, the finding. Thank you. Sir, uh, can you please uh, uh, tell it again? So the question was that um, you've presented an in silico mm -hmm. analysis, and uh, I believe the question was, what's the way forward from here? For, for the uh, your ligand conjugates. Okay. Uh, so you are asking about the wet lab. Do you it is, it yes, Do you intend to uh, advance to wet lab? What's the plan for yes, this? Sir, yes, like? sir. Sir, uh, this uh, is this study is published. This is uh, entirely in silico work. So currently we are planning uh, to do the uh, wet lab studies on this. We are planning to do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So um, let's uh, give uh, Priya a round of applause. And I'd like to um, invite the next session chair, Dr. Mariama Sajo Diallo, to come and take the next session. Right, so before Mariama comes, please, there's just a bit of change in the program, which I want you all to observe. Um, so during Mariama's session, those of you going to the other room, the last session is cancelled, um, is moved to tomorrow instead. Um, by whom? I can't even see. The, the last session. Um, Which is chaired by... Uh, this one, can you read it? Sorry, David, I don't have my... Chaired by David Kota. Like, this one, this one is Gabriella. Right, so Gabriella's talk is moved to tomorrow. Sorry, my sight. Right, so that one is moved to tomorrow. And then the next session two is cancelled. Um, so he's helping me. Because That's our uh, 14 Fatima. Fatima Takas, um, trends of, um, yeah, oral 14. Okay, so that'll be the last session. So that one too is cancelled. And yeah, so um, Gabriela's own move to tomorrow, and then we'll all have to come here and then be at this session. Okay, so we'll move to. Um, they, they are moved to this time? Yeah. Okay, they are all moved to the, on, uh, oh, okay, okay. 
So we'll have two orals now, and then everyone will converge here um, for the presentation of IRCB SEPASH. That's why, um, that's uh, one of the new centers, uh, Wanida centers in Benin. I hope it's clear. Okay, so basically, there's a last session in uh, room two, in the Azalea room, which has been moved to tomorrow. And that is to allow everybody to come here and listen to the presentation by IRCB Sepash. That's the reason, right? Yes, it's postponed to tomorrow. So, Mariama? Bonjour à tout le monde. Donc, euh, je vais avec un très, très grand plaisir et un grand honneur modérer cette session euh, qui va euh, comporter trois présentations. Et toutes ces présentations sont orales. Donc, il va y avoir deux présentations qui vont se tenir dans la salle et il y a une présentation en ligne que nous allons suivre. Et chacun des présentateurs aura euh, 10 minutes de communication et 5 minutes de discussion. Voilà. Donc, on va commencer par le premier orateur, qui est Oumaru Sedou. J'espère que je n'écorche pas son nom. Si c'est le cas, je m'en excuse. Qui est un étudiant en master et qui vient de l'université Amadou Bello euh, du Nigeria. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Saidu from Ahmadi Bell University, Zaria. I'm standing before you to make my presentation on the topic, cell-based screening of MacKGS Healthcare Open Global Health Library for identification of new drug candidates for the treatment of schistosomiasis. By way of introduction, schistosomiasis is a neglected tropical disease caused by the parasitic blood fluke of the genus schistosoma. The disease is basically classified into urinary or urogenital schistosomiasis and intestinal schistosomiasis based on the species causing the disease. While urinary schistosomiasis is caused by schistosoma hematobium, intestinal schistosomiasis is caused by a wide range of species including S. monsoni, S. japonicum, S. meconga, S. intercalatum, and S. guinensis. Transmission occurs in over 78 countries, globally distributed among tropics and subtropics, with 732 million people at risk of infection and 280 to 500,000 annual deaths. In Nigeria, about over 100 million people are at risk of infection, out of which about 29 million people are already infected, ranking the country as the most endemic globally. There is no vaccine available, and treatment relies on praxicontel as the only recommended drug, and hence there is need to search for alternative chemotherapy against the disease. The MacKGS Open Global Health Library provides a set of uh, small molecules to researchers globally free of charge with the aim to identify new approaches to debilitating infectious diseases, especially in low- and middle-income countries. Figure one shows the life cycle of the parasite, where eggs from an infected individuals are shed in urine, in urine, in urine offices into the water body. The eggs hatch are released 
Muracidia. Muracidia finds a suitable freshwater snail and penetrate, and the snail is differentiated into sporocyst and eventually into free swimming saccharia. The saccharia are infective larval form, which, when in contact with human skin, penetrates. It penetrates the human skin. During the transdermal penetration, it loses its cell to become schistosomula, which enters into the blood circulation and migrates to portal blood and liver, where they matured into adults. Adult male and female um, uh, worms paired to reside in mesenteric veins of the intestine, as in the case of urine, um, uh, intestinal schistosomiasis, or venous fluxus of bladder, as in the case of urinary schistosomiasis, where they produce numerous eggs that are associated with the pathology of the disease. Methods. Freshwater snails were collected from their natural habitat and were identified morphologically. Blino snails were subjected to saccharial shading. The saccharia were quantified and subjected to in vitro anti saccharial activity testing. The effect of 250 MACKGS compounds were on the saccharia survival was evaluated by incubating 50 micromolar final concentration of each of the compounds in a 20 microliter solution containing eight saccharia and 96 well plates. Negative controls were either added to the same volume of distilled water or DMSO as the control, while positive controls were cont uh, contained mefloquine. The number of live parasites after six hours of exposure at room temperature were uh, counted in each well under microscope. The saccharia were considered dead when they are immortal, sunk under the well, or having their tail detached. Result. Morphological identification of schistosoma parasite. After collecting fresh water snails from their natural habitat, they were identified morphologically, and this is a picture showing bulinous snails that were uh, collected and used for this story. Bulinous snails were subjected, uh, were exposed to light for saccharial shading, and this figure three shows the uh, schistosoma saccharia isolated from infected blindness snails and which was used for the study. Assessment of in vitro, uh, in vitro assessment of KGS compound against schistosoma saccharia. Figure four shows the in vitro effect of 250 mark KGS compound on saccharia survival. Upon incubation of each of the 250 compounds with saccharia solution, a varying degree of parasite mortality was recorded in 34 compounds when compared to the control groups where all the parasites were intact and motile. Plate one shows the microscopic images of saccharia upon six hours, after six hours of incubation with the compounds. When compared with the control groups where all the parasites are intact and motile, the wells containing the compounds where the parasites uh, were exposed have their parasite, uh, the saccharias, uh, immortal, and some having their tails detached. This finding is in line with the finding of Isa et al. 2011, where they recorded saccharial sinking and tail detachment upon incubating the, uh, the saccharia solution with biltoforcin drug. Determination of half maximal inhibitory concentration. Figure 5 shows the dose response curves of all the 34 compounds that produce varying degree of parasite mortality. 10 to 50 micromolar of each of the compounds were incubated with the saccharia solution in order to determine the IC50. Table one shows the IC50 values of all the 34 compounds that produce varying degree of parasite mortality. Compound A4, A5, B10, and C1 have the least IC50 as highlighted in red. Determination of killing kinectics of KGS compounds. Now, in order to determine the killing kinetics of the compounds, the best four compounds with the least IC50 were further incubated with the parasite and monitored over time. Compound A4 and C1 were able to produce 100% parasite mortality 
within five and 10 minutes of exposure respectively, while compound B10 and A5 were able to clear all the parasite population within two hours of exposure. In conclusion, findings from this study suggest that MACGS compounds could serve as possible leads to new schistosomia C drug. So some of my references. Thank you for listening. Merci beaucoup. On a économisé cinq minutes. Donc, euh, s'il y a des questions dans la salle, je pense que... Euh, voilà. Y a-t-il des questions Pas de questions Oui Allez-y. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I want to find out um, why did you use all the bulinus snails for the experiments? Because we know Bamfilaria also transmits the mantonite, and that is quite difficult to treat as compared to rheumatoid infection. So, if this drug is going to be a new target, why did you use only bulinus snail for the experiment? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, the, the scope of the work. Uh, this is an MSc work. Uh, we don't want to uh, expand the scope of the work. And another thing is that the species of the snails that are available within the study area were used. Although there are biomphalaria in the study area, we conducted survey before we started the study. So those spe species of the snails that are abundant in the study area were those of blindness. So for easy access to the saccharia, we opted to use blindness only. Yes. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Un autre intervenant? Une dernière question? Oui? Okay, thank you for your presentation. So I wanted to be clear on something. Um, how many parasites or oh, yeah, did you use for the experiments? Because when I look at the pictures, I see like one or two. I don't know if you had an, like a higher cell density that you use for the, especially the IC50 determination and the mortality rate. Okay, in each of the well, we tried to uh, use et saccharia per well. Et saccharia per well. Yes. So it's, this parasite density is et saccharia per well. Yes. Merci beaucoup. D'autres questions OK. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Saïdou. Et... Euh... Donc, on va passer à la prochaine présentation qui va être faite en ligne. Je ne sais pas si la régie est prête. OK. Donc, on me fait signe que c'est prêt. C'est Monsieur Touri, PhD euh, de l'Université de Canada. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Oui, nous voyons votre écran. Si vous pouvez vous mettre en mode diaporama, s'il vous plaît. Hello everyone, um, I guess you're hearing me. So I'm Abdullahi Toure uh, from the Gambia. I'm a PhD student in uh, McGill University in Canada from the Division of Experimental Medicine. So I will be presenting on uh, the allosteric regulation of the repressor activator protein one by the uh, phosphoinositide 345 uh, 3-phosphate um, controls on and off switching of the telomeric expression sites in trypanosomes. So typhonosomes are unicellular protozoan parasites, and these um, parasites um, treat millions of lives, uh, including humans and animals globally. And so the subspecies typhonosome um, brucea gambiansi and then typhonosome brucea rodesiensi causes the human African typhonosomiasis, whilst the, the 
with a subspecies such as T. brucei congolensi, Vivax brucei brucei, and um, T. brucei evansi causes the animal African type, um, the animal type of osomiasis. So the parasite has a very complex life cycle alternating between the sessifly vector and also the, 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 the mammalian host. So the parasite is um, exclusively an extracellular parasite that um, it circulates within the bloodstream of the, 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 the host and the, 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 either the bloodstream or the screen of the host. <clears throat> so at some point in the, during the life cycle, it transverses the blood brain barrier and enters the central nervous system where it causes some sleep disorders and the name sleeping sickness. Now this parasite uses antigenic variation. Since it's an extracellular parasite, so it uses antigenic variation now to evade the immune system of the host. S'il vous plaît. So antigenic variation. S'il vous plaît, Monsieur Touré, on a du mal, vos, vos diapos ne passent pas. Est-ce que vous pouvez essayer I, de les faire défiler, s'il vous plaît? And, okay. I don't understand uh, French, actually. Can you move your slide, please? Yeah, I'm moving my slides. Oh, okay, you are not seeing me? No, here, not. Wow. Yes, actually, it's in the presentation mode. Uh, now, yes. So now you can see it. Okay, let me try again. Are you seeing the slides moving? No. Oh. Then I have to remove it from the presentation mode. I think like, um, because like when I put it in the presentation mode, I'm moving from my end, but it's no sound from your side. Are you seeing it moving now? Yes. yes. Okay, then we can move with this one. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, so I was, as I was saying, the parasite is just a unicellular parasite, and then it's found within sub-Saharan Africa. And while the animal type of somiasis, which is caused by this other subspecies, is found um, globally, actually, um, within Africa and other continents like Asia and um, South America. And the parasite has a complex life cycle, and then this involves the sessifly vector and then the mammalian host, which can be human or animals. So at some point, the parasite um, crosses the blood-brain barrier and enters the central nervous system where it causes um, sleep disorders, hence the name is sleeping sickness. So being an extracellular parasite, the parasite um, uses antigenic variation now to evade the host immune responses. So the antigenic variation is a process whereby the parasite will change their surface code and um, periodically change it so that they know they can um, find a way of like avoiding the immune system. So for terpenosomes, what they do is like they change their surface code um, by expressing uh, different variant surface glycoprotein genes on the surface. So this can be seen here. So these are thick surfaces that block um, the, the, the surface of the parasite. So they periodically change this one. Interestingly, these parasites have like over 2,500 variant surface glycoprotein genes. And then these genes are um, actually expressed from the subtelomeric arrays as can um, as seen here in red or from the telomeric expression side. So they have over 20, they have like 20 um, copies of the um, telomeric expression site, and then this is the structure of the, um, the expression site. So the bloodstream expression site have like um, the promoter in red here, and then it has um, SLs, which are the expression site associated genes, and then it has a repeat, 70 base pair repeat region, and then the VSG, that's the variant such as glycoprotein gene here, and the telomere. While the metacyclic form of the parasite has a promoter, and then it has a, sub, a small uh, repeat region here and a VSD, and then a telomeric repeat region here. So what it does is like only a single VSD gene is expressed at a time. So the remaining ones, like you have the 19 um, telomeric expression sites that uh, um, they are normally kept silent. So the active expression site normally have like you know association with other genes like the VEX genes and so on while the, the the silent expression sites have different composition and they associate with other genes 
as yeah, other genes such as like you know, or other proteins such as the repressor activator protein one. Now, what is known about these are uh, the, the switching process of, of, of the, uh, the the VSD genes. We know that the, 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 the process happens through transcriptional switching or through recombination. But you know, interestingly, we don't know what regulates this process and then what even initiates the switching process of the parasite. So, phosphoinositide signaling pathway was uh, uh, my supervisor, um, Igor Sestari, who um, investigated this process. Um, claimed that like uh, the phosphoinositides play a role in regulating this um, process in the trypanosomes. So, the phosphoinositide signaling pathway involves um, kinases and phosphatases, and they are metabolites like the, the um, lipid conjugated phosphoinositides or the inositol phosphates, and these are mostly found on the cell membranes or maybe in other membranous uh, um, organelles like the nucleus. So he did a study whereby, like, you know, he looked at the localization of these uh, phosphoinositide enzymes, like the PIF5 phase, which is phosphoinositide inositol phosphate 5 phosphatase, and other, um, um, like the phospholipase C, and then the PIF5 case, where they are located. So most of them are located in the plasma membrane. And interestingly, the PIP5 phase co-localizes with the repressor activator protein 1, which is known to, rip, um, to uh, interact with only the silent expression sites. So what they did was like they knocked down some of these genes and found that like once you knock down some of these genes, it causes like, you know, the expression of multiple BSD genes instead of expressing only a single one. So you can see here that there is the depression of the, 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 the BSD genes. Also, if you temporarily knock down again and then allow the expression of the gene, the parasites will go back to the expression of a single VSD gene. But what will happen is now they will change to another VSD gene. Like if they, are, they were expressing VSD2, then they will change to other type of VSDs like you know, VSD3, VSD18, and so on. So meaning like you know, the, 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 the phosphoinositide signaling pathway is actually playing a role in controlling, in regulating the expression and switching of the VSD genes. So they went further now to look at, like, you know, the role of these enzymes um, in the regulation process. They found a complex called the theromeric expression site complex. In this complex, they know that, like, okay, the PIP5 phase and then the repressor activator proteins interact. And this one, um, this complex move as a 0.9 megadaltin complex in a, um, a native gel. So if you break, like if you knock down any of either the P5 phase or the RAP1, it causes the repress, like, you know, it causes this uh, complex to disintegrate, to break down. But now if you mutate um, a double mutation in P5 phase, it just reserves the, the, the complex, but now the enzyme loses its activity. So it cannot dephosphorylate this P3. So the, the, the complex is there, but the enzyme cannot function, uh, it cannot perform its function anymore. Now, based on that, like, you know, after generating those cell lines, then we went on, you know, I performed um, an RNA-seq comparing the genes that they did, sorry, these parasites that we are expressing, the wild type, P5 phase, or the mutant, to look at the role of this enzyme, the, the enzymatic activity. So what we found out, like, that there is upregulation of many VSG genes, like can be seen here, the, um, the black ones are the bloodstream expression side VSG genes, while the green ones are the metacyclic expression side VSD genes. So this can be clearly seen here. In the wild type, there is a single expression here, while in the mutants, there is operation. Different VSD genes have been expressed. So this is the pole chain. This was true for also the metacyclic expression side, as well as even the subtelomeric RS. But interestingly, there was down regulation of the active VSD. That was like the VSD gene that was previously expressed. There was down regulation of that one. And then I went on now to see, like, what will happen if I re-express the wild type? So, like, the, mostly what happens, like, you know, the, the, the parasite express only a single gene. But once now you express the mutant, the parasites express different VSD genes. So, but if you restore the expression of the wild type, they will go back to the expression of a single VSD gene, but in the process, they will switch. So, these are the wild types expressed in the, 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 the only a single VSD gene compared to the mutants, the different experiments where the parasites were expressing the different VSD genes. So you can see there is a switching of the expressed VSD genes. Now, since we know that like, you know, the, the P5 phase was shown from the, the microscopy that, you know, it co-localized with the repressor activator protein one in the nucleus, we want to know 
where in the nucleus, where in the genome is the repressor activator protein actually binding then? So we did chip seq analysis. When after doing the chip seq analysis, what we found was the repressor activator actually, uh, protein one actually binds only to the, um, to the silent expression site and not to the active expression site. So you can see here, and then this binding is only at the 70 base pair repeats and then the telomeric repeats in them. That is the regions that are flanging the VSG gene, not to the VSG gene. So this is true for all the, 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 the expression sites. And, you know, like, you know, this is true for all the bloodstream expression sites as well as the metacyclic expression site. So these regions that this repressor activator protein is binding mostly have like their um, TAA rich regions or GTAA rich regions. And in addition to that, also interestingly, we found that like, you know, the repressor activator protein also bind to the centromere. And, but one thing that was known about the centromere in these parasites is that the centromere also is an AT rich region, which is similar to the 70 base pair repeat and then the telomeric repeat region as we have seen in the previous slide. The same thing happens in the metacyclic expression site. So the RAP1, the protein binds only to the regions that are besides the VSD genes and not to the VSD gene itself. So based on this, then we wanted to validate- Mr. Turo, you have escape. just one minute. Okay, I'm just finishing. So we performed the, 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 some binding assays to see where they are binding. And then we found that you know the 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 um, the, uh, the wrap one of the, the, the protein binds to the seventy uh, to the uh, the DNA seventy base pair and then the, the telomeric repeat region, and also in the presence of this PIP three, this binding is disrupted. So the PIP three disrupt the binding, and then we validated this using the um, uh, the microscale thermophoresis. So the idea that we have is that you know in the presence of PIP three. So, so like, you know, RAP1 binds to the DNA when there is no PIP3. So, but once PIP3 is there, the PIP3 binds to RAP1 and then causes a conformational change. So this causes the RAP1 to lose the DNA and then the DNA is free for the um, RNA polymerase to transcribe. And then we validated this also, like, you know, we went in now to do the in vivo. This other one was in vitro. So we went in in vivo to see, okay, is this the same case in vivo? So, our, our hypothesis was Mr. like when Ture, go to conclusion, was please. So this is the last slide. Yeah, this is the summary slide here. So we have like you know we found that like you know when the P five phase is active, then the 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 um, RAP one binds to the regions as we have seen pre previously. But when there is um, P five phase, it is inactive. Then the RAP one does not bind. So the P three binds to RAP one. Then based on that, now, you know, we develop a model. And then this model is that, you know, in presence of P5 phase, RAP1 is bound to the DNA. And then the, the RNA polymerase one cannot transcribe these ones. And then the VSD genes are silent. But once it is activating, the P3 binds to RAP1. And then now this causes the DNA to get loose. And the RNA polymerase one will transcribe these. And then this causes the activation of the expression site. So this is the first system in the parasite, in this parasite, that has like, you know, there is an allosteric regulation of the, 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 the regulatory protein. Um, and it controls, it's kind of like a molecular switch that turn on the expression site and also turn it off. So it is the first time that, you know, this has been reported in this parasite. So, and like, you know, it's essential for the switch in between the expression site and also during the developmental stages of the parasite from human now when it goes to the, 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 the Monsieur Touré. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I would like to thank the, the, the entire membership of our lab. And yeah, these are the membership of the lab here. And it's located in this building here at the McDonald campus of Miguel University. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Très, présentation très intéressante. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions en ligne ou dans la salle. Il n'y a pas de questions pour M. Touré D'accord. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup pour votre présentation.
Donc, on va passer au prochain intervenant. Il s'agit de Dr Aurore Onto, professeur en parasitologie de la Faculté des sciences de la santé de l'Université abomey calavi qui va venir présenter... Euh, il est le directeur du serpage, du laboratoire du serpage, et il va venir présenter ce nouveau. Ah, je m'excuse. Elle va venir présenter ce nouveau centre. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je voudrais juste rectifier que moi, je ne suis pas le directeur du serpage, mais le directeur de l'IRCB. Le directeur de l'IRCB, c'est le professeur Achille Masouboudi. Et je voudrais déjà, même avant de commencer la présentation, faire ses excuses à Wanida et tout le monde, tous les participants ici, pour son absence, parce qu'il devait être avec nous, mais il a eu un problème de vol au dernier moment, ce qui a fait qu'il n'est pas là aujourd'hui. Donc, je voudrais donc profiter de ce canal pour présenter ses excuses. Avant d'aller dans la présentation, je voudrais également remercier Wanida pour avoir accepté le partenariat avec RCB Serpage. Euh, comme l on l'a dit hier tantôt, c'était euh, un partenariat qui fait partie des derniers centres partenaires du réseau Wanida. Et donc, euh, je ne vois pas la présentation. Je ne vois pas la présentation. S'il vous plaît, euh, pouvez-vous afficher la présentation Ok, donc euh, nous allons présenter l'Institut de recherche clinique du Bénin et le Centre d'études de recherche sur les pathologies associées à la grossesse et à l'enfance. Euh, donc, euh, cette présentation se fera. Ah, ça, c'est pas la dernière. Hein. C'est pas la dernière. Tu peux prendre ton ordi Apparemment, la régie a loupé les mises à jour. Donc, il y a eu des mises à jour dans, dans la présentation. Tu peux lui remettre ton... C'est bon, la solution est trouvée C'est bon Ok.
Ok. Toutes nos excuses. Donc, euh, nous allons faire cette présentation. Euh, suivant le plan, nous allons présenter rapidement les objectifs du centre, le plateau technique, les grands projets en cours, nos atouts, les partenaires et le réseautage. Alors, pour avant de présenter les objectifs, je dirais brièvement que l'IRCB a été à une historique euh, qui a été construite entre le partenariat avec l'IRD et les centres de recherche du Bénin. Et donc, l'IRCB a, a été mise en place en 2015. Alors, les objectifs, c'est de pérenniser la recherche clinique, les activités de recherche clinique et fondamentale au Bénin, mettre à disposition des partenaires intéressés, du personnel formé aux bonnes pratiques de biologie, aux bonnes pratiques cliniques et biologiques, des laboratoires équipés et un dispositif d'analyse des données adéquates des structures, des sites de terrain pour réaliser les essais cliniques. Fournir également au personnel du laboratoire technique et scientifique de bonnes pratiques cliniques et biologiques, aussi bien que ce soit pour les Béninois, les Africains et d'autres sites également. Donc, établir également, enfin, des partenariats avec d'autres places au niveau de l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Et donc, pour plusieurs, pour plus d'amples informations, nous avons mis à la page 46 de l'Abstract Book de Wanida, nous avons quelques informations sur l'IRCB et également il y a le site IRCB. Alors, de quel plateau technique nous disposons euh, Alors, nous avons d'abord... Il y, a, il y a une diapositive qui manque. Il y a une diapositive qui manque, celle relative au plateau technique concernant tout, surtout les recherches cliniques en termes de spectrophotomètre, d'hématologie, de microscope et d'automate d'hématologie. Ici, nous avons présenté le plat, la plateforme immunologique avec des cytomètres des flux, des techniques des chaînes ELISA, de Luminès et l'ellipsoute. Nous avons également une plateforme de culture cellulaire avec des hôtes à flux laminaires et des incubateurs. Également une plateforme de biologie moléculaire avec des séquenceurs un, auto, une appa, un appareil pour réaliser la QPCR, un extracteur automatique, qui est là, les séquenceurs. Et puis, euh, nous avons un appareil pour le QPCR de VIA7. Alors, quels sont les grands projets en cours en ce moment Parmi les projets en cours, nous pouvons citer le projet qui, qui est relatif à la qualité de l'air et la qualité de l'asthme chez les enfants, donc explorer la qualité de l'air et la qualité de l'asthme et la vie des sujets asthmatiques au Bénin. Et elle a été financée par la NR et se déroule au Bénin. Ensuite, nous avons un, nouveau, un nouvel outil pour euh, la recherche, la surveillance environnementale des géo-elmétiases. Donc, c'est la surveillance des géos elles-mêmes des parasites donc transmis par le sol, un nouvel outil à partir de l'eau et des prélèvements du sol qui a été financé également par la NIH et se déroule au Bénin. Il y a également le projet du Home Tree qui est l'étude de la faisabilité de l'interruption de la transmission des géos elles à travers une administration de masse. Donc, cette étude est en train de prendre fin et a été financé par la fondation Bill Melinda Gates et se déroule sur trois sites que sont le Bénin, le Malawi et l'Inde. Ensuite, nous avons un essai clinique qui évalue l'efficacité de la trithérapie atémétel-luméphantrine atovacone pro guanil versus atémétel-luméphantrine dans le traitement du paludisme simple financé par le DTCP et qui se déroule au Bénin, au Burkina Faso au Gabon, au Ghana et au Mali. Alors, tout ça, pour plus d'informations sur ces études, nous avons donc quelques 
liens, quelques liens sur lesquels vous pouvez avoir euh, des informations. Quels sont nos partenaires Alors, euh, à gauche ici, nous avons nos partenaires universitaires. Donc, tout ce qui est ici concerne le volet universitaire. Nous avons la Faculté des sciences de la santé de Cotonou. Nous avons la Faculté des sciences techniques de l'université, le Centre de recherche des maladies infectieuses et tropicales, l'Institut régional de santé publique et l'université de Paracou. Ensuite, de ce côté, nous avons tout ce qui est au ministère de la Santé, à savoir le programme national de lutte contre le paludisme, le centre hospitalier université de la mère et de l'enfant, le centre hospitalier université national, le programme national de lutte contre les maladies transmissibles, le laboratoire des fièvres hémorragiques virales et le centre de recherche entomologique de Cotonou. Donc, sur le plan local, ce sont les partenaires avec lesquels nous collaborons. Alors, sur le plan africain, nous avons CRML, le CRML du Gabon, l'Université du Ghana, l'Université Onfeu Boigny de Côte d'Ivoire, le MRTC du Mali, le Burkina Faso, l'Université de Ouagadougou et puis l'Université de Lomé. Sur le plan international, nous avons également d'autres partenaires tels que l'Université de Washington, l'Université de Californie, l'Université Impérial College, le, collège, le Smith College, l'Université de Pépillan, l'Université de Toulouse, Mérite, l'IRD et puis le National History Museum. Donc, sur le plan international, voici les partenaires que nous avons. Alors, quels sont nos atouts? Nous avons une centrale de production sur place de la zone liquide pour nous permettre d'une conservation efficace de nos cellules. Bon, il y a une diapo qui est en train de sauter. Nous avons également une chaîne de froid bien fournie avec des congélateurs à moins 80, à moins 20 et également des, des, des des, des, des réfrigérateurs, qui, tout ça est soutenu par un groupe électrogène automatiquement, automatique qui prend le relais aussitôt à la coupure de l'énergie électrique. Nous avons une session de labo virus où les, les, la collecte des sang, du sang au niveau hospitalier est faite pour le screening de la dengue, du zika et de chikungunya, du virus de chikungunya. Donc, euh, bon, l'intéressé, la personne qui s'occupe de cette session est dans la salle et pourra éventuellement répondre à des préoccupations s'il y en avait. Là, c'est en, en termes de formation. En termes de formation, les cinq dernières années, nous avons eu 42 étudiants qui ont finalisé leur PhD. Certains sont en cours de finalisation cette année. Alors, nos partenaires techniques et financiers surtout se résument à l'IRD, la Fondation Bill et Melinda Gates, le DTCP, l'ANR, le NIH, GSK, l'AFD, etc. Alors, donc, pour finir, c'est le partenariat. C'est vrai, nous avons été adhérés au réseau Wanida et les perspectives, c'est de nouer encore d'autres partenariats afin d'avoir des centres de recherche forts et efficaces au, sur le continent africain. Merci. Merci beaucoup euh, pour euh, cette présentation qui plante le décor de ce centre qui vient d'adhérer au réseau Anida. Donc, s'il y a des questions, euh, voilà, on vous écoute.
Pas de questions D'accord. S'il n'y a pas de questions, on va applaudir le euh, docteur et puis... Euh, voilà. Donc, je pense qu'on est arrivé au terme de cette session qui comportait trois présentations. Et donc, euh, sur ce, je vais vous rendre le micro pour pouvoir continuer. Je pense que la prochaine étape, c'est peut-être euh, le déjeuner. Right, thank you for sharing the section. Um, before we go on lunch break, I think we have to be intentional to visit the poster room because we added it to the coffee break, but we see that most people are not really visiting. So please, we have about 20 minutes to all go down there to interact with the students for us to hear what they're doing and what they've displayed there. So students with your posters, can it be by your poster and then we'll all come there and have interaction with you just for a period of 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll all head towards the um, garden for lunch, if that's fine with all of us, so yeah. We have this short break before we go for lunch. Thank you. Donc avant avant uh, euh, d'aller au oui. déjeuner, euh, un rapide coup d'œil au niveau de des posters. Voilà, pour pouvoir interagir avec euh, les étudiants, ceux qui ont préparé les posters et mieux communiquer. Right. And also kind of leave your headset behind. Don't take them away. Just leave them safe here, and then we'll come back, and then we can use it. Don't put in your bags, please. And we want to take the remaining five that got missing last night. So if per chance you put in your bag and you have it mistakenly, kindly return it. Just put it on your decks, and then we'll pick it up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so poster time. 